morning. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I actually uh, prepared something that's going to begin at the national level, so we want to sort of talk about uh, the national economy. Then I'm going to drop down and talk some about uh, New Mexico uh, as a whole. Uh, and we have a few uh, ideas about the sort of regional scale. Uh, let me just sort of very briefly tell you what we do to give you some context to uh, where this presentation comes from. Uh, essentially, uh, what we do is we take a national economic model, uh, which is from IHS Global Insight, which is sort of one of the two or three large uh, uh, national economic forecasting uh, um, services. We take that, and essentially <coughs> the New Mexico model uh, looks at historic relationships between New Mexico and also uh, we actually work on sub-regional levels of Albuquerque, uh, Las Cruces, etc. And what the relationship of New Mexico and its sub-regions are with respect to the national economy. So essentially the input to the model then are the, is the national forecast and the output is um, what specifically is likely to happen um, in New Mexico. <coughs> it's very useful to begin uh, with a, uh, a review of the national economy. I will tell you, I have uh, 30 minutes and I have two hours worth of stuff, so I will move as quickly as I can through some of the stuff that uh, probably may be done in more less, um, uh, less interest to you. Uh, but there is so much going on right now in the national economy, I think it's uh, quite useful to spend a few minutes in sort of going on, uh, over some of what uh, we've been seeing. The last year has been um, very interesting. Uh, the economy has, uh, the, the, re the recovery has fully taken hold by, by virtually every measure except um, wages, which we'll talk about. Um, the boom during, or the, the rapid growth during the latter half of 2014 was very much uh, fueled by the decline in, uh, in gasoline prices which, as we'll talk about in a minute, has sort of a, uh, sort of a works two ways in New Mexico. It has a, has a plus in terms of freeing up uh, consumers' uh, money so that they can spend more money locally, but it also has a downside in terms of the, uh, the dependence that the state has on oil and gas. Uh, so, uh, in very brief, uh, what we have seen is that during the third quarter, of uh, 2014, we had 5% uh, GDP growth. That's about the fastest growth that we've seen in 15 <coughs> years plus. Uh, much of it was fueled, again, by the drop in, in, in oil and gas prices. So people have essentially more money to spend on things other than gasoline. They start to spend that on local um, products. Uh, this is a one-time thing. Once the money hits you, if, if you think in terms of growth, once you have this new money in your pocket and you spend it, you're not going to necessarily keep increasing your expenditures. You make your adjustment to expenditures one time. And so the, the, the impact in terms of the growth of the country, of the national economy, is a one-time hit. That's why we see in 2014-3, quarter three, the big boom, and then fourth quarter starting to slow. And we're going to see something like this, I think, um, going out. Uh, job growth has been really <coughs> remarkably strong, uh, and it continues. In February, we saw almost 300,000 jobs added. Uh, we saw nearly 3 million jobs added uh, during 2014. That's the most that we've seen since the late 1990s. Um, yet, and we're going to talk about this a bit, wage growth uh, continues to lag. Um, this is not necessarily new, but I think from a lot of people's perspective, there's a tremendous debate about this. Um, it's quite troubling. Uh, there's different schools of thought in terms of what's going on here, but it appears to be a breakdown in sort of a relationship that we've expected or seen for, for decades. And so it may be uh, sort of a, a an indicator of things to come, um, and certainly a challenge. Housing remains very weak. Uh, this is the case nationally, and this is the case in New Mexico as well. Um, 
kind of unusual because typically when you start to see the recession, a, a recovery, relatively early in that process, you see some uh, strength in the housing markets. We haven't necessarily seen this. Um, again, that can uh, <coughs> a lot of debate about why that might be. Uh, consumer confidence has generally been very strong, um, increasing over 2014, but very uh, recently uh, slipping a little bit, but it's hard to tell if one month is just one month or a, a change in, in trend. Uh, and, got, and oil prices, as we know, um, are low and falling, which we thought we saw a little reprieve uh, a couple weeks ago uh, during um, February. But it appears as though it's continuing to fall. So let's look uh, very briefly uh, at some numbers. Uh, this final column here is basically what we're looking at is the GDP growth by composition. So the GDP growth was 2.6%. Uh, and if you look at this, where the growth is coming from is almost is more than entirely <coughs> in, in consumption. This is consumer spending. Um, <coughs> uh, in all categories, in durable goods, which is usually a very good sign, uh, in non-durable goods, those things that you, you purchase more regularly, and services. On the other hand, what we'll notice is that Residential expenditures are very low, and they have remained very low. But if we look at this, we can see right here, just consumption alone is higher than the, the, the growth of the entire economy. So what's holding us down? There are two things that more than, two things that are really holding us down. Number one is a strong reversal of uh, the trade situation. The, Weakness in oil prices uh, and the weakness in the European economy has meant that the dollar has surged. So people who are working in export-related industries, this is troubling. Uh, the dollar is at uh, the highest mark against the euro um, as it's been in, in, in several years. And so it's very, exporters are facing headwinds. On the other hand, imports are relatively inexpensive. Uh, thus, we've seen that if you just look at that, that shaves off a full 1% growth in uh, GDP. And secondly, and something that's been occurring over a very long period of time, and obviously is very relevant here, is cuts to federal spending. Cuts to federal <coughs> spending on multiple levels, it's in terms of uh, uh, employment, but also, and more importantly, terms of what we would call procurements, uh, spending on contracts, such as, for example, labs. Uh, this is looking at our employment situation and uh, job growth. The black line is private employment, and as you can see, the recovery has been almost entire, well, has been entirely due to the growth of private sector employment. On the other hand, the government employment has fallen fell initially out of, uh, um, after the end of the stimulus package and has sort of stabilized. But growth, again, is almost entirely <coughs> in the private sector. Um, similar patterns in, this is in terms of total wage and salary dispersals, how much is being paid by employers uh, in wages and salaries to workers. This is something, let me just take a minute, uh, just kind of, I, I thought this was very, very interesting. Um, this is, this speaks of what, what is called uh, the Phillips Curve. The Phillips Curve is one of the <laughs> oldest, um, most sort of rock solid principles in, uh, in economics as we've been looking at it uh, over the last century almost. Uh, the basic idea is that lower unemployment would, would uh, generally uh, result in higher wage growth. The idea is simple that if unemployment is low, the supply of workers is low, wages are gonna go up. What these charts show are the relationship between unemployment rates and wage growth by state. If we go back to even the 1980s, what you see is the slope of this curve is relatively steep. What that means is that the states 
that had relatively low unemployment rates were also experiencing very rapid in, uh, wage growth. Conversely, those that had higher unemployment rates had very slow wage growth. Look at what has happened more recently. It seems as though wage growth now has relatively little to do with unemployment rate. This is a very, I think, a very, very important principle and it sort of lies behind what we might be looking at for a long time. The short of it is that even though we're adding jobs, even though the number of people who are looking for jobs is decreasing, there's no upward pressure on wages. No upward pressure on wages over the long term can, be, can mean less demand for those basic types of goods that drive the economy. Coming back to the slide a couple times, uh, two, two ago, I think, consumption. Consumption is largely dependent on <coughs> wage growth over a long period of time. And so this is raising some flags uh, and a huge debate uh, within economics. <coughs> Is it something that is a change in the game, or is it something that's only sort of cyclical, something that's just happening now because of the severity of the recession? Uh, we'll jump to that. Um, the deficit, uh, we're looking, uh, the two lines here are basically uh, more recent estimates and older estimates. They haven't really changed. We've seen uh, some stabilization of this over the period of time. But I think the key point is that the relative strength of the economy has been very good news uh, for the federal deficit. Um, it has been shrinking, in fact, shrinking even a little bit less, uh, more rapidly than we expected even three or four months ago. And that is almost entirely due uh, to economic growth at large. There's no one factor that has a greater effect on the deficits than, than GDP growth. Uh, looking at interest rates, um, the story here is that almost everybody <coughs> expects that by mid, within three months or so, probably mid-2015, we're going to see the first adjustments at the Fed by the Federal Reserve, the first increases in interest rates. Um, these then uh, essentially cycle through the rest and affect uh, mortgage rates, commercial rates, etc. cetera. Uh, we expect it to uh, continue the Fed rate to continue to increase to about three and three quarters percent um, by 2000, mid early 2017. Um, this forecast has not changed very much um, in some time. And that's very good news. Uh, uh, financial markets oftentimes it's more important than the absolute levels is how um, the suddenness with which expectations change. And so the, and many would argue, actually, that's why the stock market continues to do relatively well, or very well, because expectations um, have been met and, and people are relatively confident in their investments. Uh, this is looking at our GDP forecast. Essentially, what we're looking at is continued growth in the area of about 2.5% or so, it's a little bit more tame than it was uh, a, few, uh, a few quarters ago, the forecast. Uh, in context, 2.5% continuous, 2.5% uh, isn't bad, but this is not what we've seen in the pre-recession period, where we're, we often saw uh, growth uh, over 4%, and if you go back to the 1990s, it was often more than 4%, <coughs> uh, perhaps a new normal. Uh, again, the for, uh, employment forecast, uh, every time here, the forecast, the numbers seem to be exceeding expectation pretty regularly. Uh, so, quick chart that I want to show that I want to come back to this when we talk about New Mexico. Uh, where do we expect uh, uh, jobs by sector? This right here, professional and business services, which include a few different subcategories, but one of them is called professional and technical services, um, which include scientists, engineers, uh, architects, uh, lawyers, accountants, etc. This has been um, 
one of the fastest and strongest sectors of the recovery. Uh, it has really had the greatest contribution in terms of net growth of the jobs, but more importantly, these are well-paying jobs. And so these tend to be the types of jobs that create secondary demand in, in, in retail, um, et cetera. Uh, so, and, and one actually could say, if you start looking at the housing market, the sort of upper middle class, upper middle income, higher income uh, job, uh, housing markets has not been all that compared to the middle class. So this sector <coughs> has been performing extremely well. We're going to see a very sharp contrast uh, to uh, New Mexico. Uh, consumer prices, uh, the short point here is that the core is uh, without oil and gas. And what we've seen right here is that uh, is that uh, <coughs> prices have been, uh, if anything, we're a little concerned um, uh, that prices are a little almost too soft. Uh, certainly in Europe, uh, less here. But this is a 2% flat line, which is exactly what the Federal Reserve uh, targets. Um, and so this, uh, some of the risks, there's only five of them. I guess I eliminated the other five. They're not all that scary to me. Uh, <laughs> there are things like uh, natural hazards or something when you get down to nine or 10. And, uh, I, I don't trust economists to be very good at predicting natural hazards. <laughs> Uh, but mainly, the, the key point here is that the risks are increasingly international. Uh, if we looked back three years ago, the risks were almost entirely domestic. They focused on domestic policy more than anything else. Um, were we going to have a sequester? Were we going to have uh, a big fight over the debt ceiling, et cetera, et cetera? They're all domestic policy issues. Now we're looking much more at international um, variables, China, Europe, uh, petroleum markets, et cetera. Uh, these are just alternative scenarios. Um, I think the, the key point here is so that uh, this is sort of the upside scenario, and this is the downside scenario. Uh, it's hard to interpret this without having seen earlier um, forms of this, but I think the most important point is that uh, in the short term, the pessimistic is way below because the, sort of the downside risk is greater. But the second point I would make is that these remain within a relatively narrow window, which is uh, Let's talk to New uh, go to New Mexico. Uh, some, just the big picture, I guess. New Mexico has been, uh, recovery uh, needs air quotes. Um, it has been sluggish at best. Uh, of, the four, of the 50 kind of states plus um, uh, DC, there are only um, three states, I believe, uh, that still have employment levels below those of the pre-recession period, and New Mexico is one of them. Uh, the labor, this has had a very significant impact on the labor force, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, demographic. Uh, the most recent, and we're talking about since mid-14 uh, data, is relatively much more po uh, positive. We're seeing positive numbers. We're seeing employment growth of 1.5% or something, as opposed to they essentially flat that we've seen for four years. So that's um, rather uh, promising, though it is still preliminary. Oil prices uh, cuts two ways. We'll take a look at that very briefly. And overall, the outlook at this point is for sustained, if uh, somewhat unspectacular by historic standards, uh, growth going up as far as uh, to 2018. Um, we expect only to reach that point, the pre-recession peak, uh, which was 2007 in New Mexico, where actually ends up. Uh, by 2017, the, the nation hit that, that peak in 2000, end of 2013. Okay, uh, recent history, uh, the blue box here is meant to sort of obscure uh, the red line. The point is that it's sort of a largely methodological uh, blip. They changed the way they were counting jobs in New Mexico. So these numbers are not entirely credible. 
But the key point here is that, as you can see, we were a bit uh, late to the, the recession, never a bad thing. Um, the depth of the recession was very similar to the nation. We tracked the nation beautifully coming out of the recession. Before. And then around 2011, when the nation continued on an upward trend, New Mexico started moving sideways. We were not seeing the growth that we saw, though, um, and I, I would more or less draw a line relatively straight across here, we have seen some more recent upturn. Um, we tend to focus on employment growth. It's the best indicator, the most solid indicator of economic activity in our, in our state, in, in a single state. Let's look at us compared to some of our neighbors. This is looking at employment basically uh, indexed to 2009. So let's sort of say 2009 is the norm. What we've seen is that some of our neighbors, in particular Texas and Utah and Colorado, have been performing extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, the red line here is, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, this line right here is the US. Here's New Mexico. Um, this can be, everybody likes to sort of talk, compare us to our neighbors. Uh, I think it's kind of like the old uh, sort of high school sort of thing, you know, your, your, your chief rival, which is next door. I think increasingly it means less uh, because economic growth is somewhat less of a geographic factor right now. The reason that Texas is growing is different than the reason why Colorado is growing. And it's different than the, the factors that are happening in New Mexico. So it's no longer like, oh, the Southwest is doing very well, uh, sort of a move to the Sun Belt. It's more state specific. Um, but the point still remains, some of our neighbors have been strongly outperforming the nation. New Mexico has not. So from a policy point of view, it's useful to look at what are the other states nearby doing, um, other than sort of just depending on their location. This is looking at the same thing uh, on a metropolitan level. Historically, recoveries in New Mexico are driven by Albuquerque. That is another way of forward. It's not driven, it doesn't happen without Albuquerque being uh, participating. Albuquerque has 42% of the jobs of the greater Albuquerque uh, in the state. You're not gonna get the state growing both as a whole if Albuquerque's not participating. Albuquerque has been weaker than the rest of the state. So this is one of the factors. This is what I want to point out in particular. <coughs> we were talking before about this professional and technical services, the subcomponent of that uh, business and professional service uh, sector. Uh, look at some of our neighbors have really been uh, growing, surging really in this sector. This is one sector that New Mexico has been um, very weak at. Uh, we have, over the four year period, 2010 to 2014, been 49th in the country in terms of the growth in this sector. Um, we often look at these things, oh, 49th, unfortunately, in many respects, when we look at things like poverty, we're kind of used to that. Uh, that's typical. Uh, this is not the case. This is not typical. Historically, when we look at job growth, New Mexico may have long been a very poor state, but we've been a rapidly growing state. Well, so to look at this, where were we during, let's say, the five, six year period pre-recession in terms of our rank in growth by sector? In this particular sector, business and professional services, we're the sixth fastest growing state in the country. Uh, now, since we, well, during this period of time, 50th. Uh, another interesting thing is it's not, uh, uh, oil and gas has been too, uh, has been a strong uh, has a advantage for us, but that by itself has not been able to sort of push everything else along. So a good question is what is going on right here in this sector? This, <coughs> Being a bit of a downer here on, on uh, 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 at 7:30, but uh, in some ways that's uh, my job, at least to sort of call it as I see it. Um, this number here, uh, I would take with a bit of grain of salt, a grain of salt, because it's a short period of time. The data is often subject to revision.
division. But what we are seeing here is if we look at population changes, this is New Mexico alone. Essentially, population changes by natural increase, more people being born than dying, and by migration. And migration, net migration, in and out, uh, can be international or it can be domestic, which is to say in relation to the other 49 states. If you look historically, going back about at least four or five uh, decades, we grew somewhere in the area pretty, pretty solidly, about 20,000 or so per year or more, actually. If you go back to the 70s, it was up closer to 30. And it was relatively even across um, the board. And in particular, we were always very strong in domestic migration. Far more people moving into the state than out of the state. If we look at just the 2012-13, this is the most recent data, we had 10,000, more than 10,000 people move from New Mexico out. This single factor alone more than outweighs the increase, the natural increase. Bottom line is that during this most recent period, 2012-13, for which we have data, is the first time that we've seen in more than 60 years that New Mexico has lost population. Uh, I would say that these things tend to be a little bit more flexible than you expect. Jobs start coming back. Many of these people are not necessarily moving away for good. We do not know. There's, there was a lot of press um, in, in the latter part of 2014 about <coughs> the flight of the best and the brightest. Um, we don't know that. That is entirely anecdotal. <coughs> I think there's just as much reason, so in other words, a, a sort of brain drain. People weren't finding jobs, recent college graduates weren't finding jobs, or leaving for, uh, for greener fields. Uh, this is not statistically documented. Um, to the contrary, I would actually suggest that maybe uh, that much of this might actually be people who are much more uh, middle income, lower middle income, who are not finding jobs here, who are going out of state for jobs if only temporarily, and that this may be reversed when the economy begins to improve. Uh, I won't go into this because we're not uh, overly concerned with oil here, but the short of it is that uh, uh, the negative is in two ways. Uh, one way is uh, a loss of job, uh, a loss of jobs in the areas where oil is being, oil and gas is produced, is it, is it down? A second down is the very significant contribution of oil and gas to the state budget. So you have loss of oil and gas revenues, you have cuts to state budgets, which mean less state uh, employment, and it also means uh, less spending by the state, and therefore jobs by uh, private businesses. I want to point this, uh, quickly make this note. Very interesting. Uh, in 2011, New Mexico's permanent fund, combined between uh, two or three of them, uh, was about $11 billion. Um, largely because of the stock market, it is now $20 billion. Uh, it is the third largest pr uh, permanent fund in the country. Texas has 53 billion, 54, Alaska 51, 52, New Mexico 20. Uh, pulling up fourth place is uh, Wyoming with less than six billion. So we have six, $20 billion in the bank, um, uh, which we call a rainy day fund. Texas has been very creative in using their, uh, their, their, their permanent fund and using it to invest and in, uh, provide capital to a lot of sort of faster growing smaller businesses, kind of acting as a venture uh, investor. New Mexico has a similar program, but it's essentially not a fund. There's only about $20 million in total out from that fund. Uh, and then on the other hand, if those up first two things are pushing uh, the economy down because of lower oil prices, pushing it up is an increase in oil, uh, in consumer spending as people have fewer, uh, smaller bills of oil. At the gas pump, you're likely to spend more money locally. We expect that this can create as much as 6,500 jobs, which is not trivial, it's almost a percent. Um, but most important, 
is that this is a one-time thing. So once the prices come down to a certain level, they will not continue to create growth. You would have to see another decline or another boost. Recent data, much more positive. Um, what we see, uh, I should have updated this. Um, if we, actually it would be about uh, 14,000, 15,000 if we brought it all the way up to, uh, to February, actually. Um, but this last six months, uh, really beginning July 2014, um, are much more positive numbers. We have solid numbers now through the third quarter, and those who are quite good, the third quarter numbers were up about 1%, which is way better than flat. Uh, the number since uh, uh, end of September are preliminary but positive. Um, here, we're looking at what we've been seeing in terms of by sector. Here's a couple of interesting things. This one I want to sort of point out in particular, and I'm going to touch on this uh, in a very briefly in a sec. <coughs> financial activities includes insurance. Uh, insurance includes many of the new forms of healthcare providers <coughs> where uh, uh, managed care organizations are required to put in a certain degree of um, sort of follow-up services. Uh, and this has really kicked in in the last 12 months. Good, I'm going to show you this. Uh, way too, number, too many numbers to look at, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus your attention right here. Medicaid. Uh, the increase in Medicaid, over, in, in, increase in Medicaid payment in New Mexico over the last, uh, over the 12, the first three quarters of 2014. Uh, we don't have more recent data than that. Uh, Medicaid payments were up more than 600, $630 million. This is entirely uh, uh, tied to the implementation of, of uh, the Affordable Care Act, and in particular, the adoption of uh, the Medicaid expansion in New Mexico. To put that in context, uh, this money alone, the increase in the flow of Medicaid dollars into New Mexico has increased personal income, total personal income in New Mexico by 0.8%. So we've been looking at personal income growth of about 4% or so. A fifth of that is due to the increase in flow of Medicaid uh, alone. This has been something, uh, up until the mid-14, we were very nervous about this. Uh, the data was not indicating that, that it had kicked in. Um, any data that we looked at, uh, whether it be coming from uh, health, sort of the health department, the actual sort of services provided, like uh, enrollments, et cetera, they weren't keeping up with what we expected. But the more recent data clearly indicates that this is kicking in. Um, now, turning to the outlook, uh, few changes that we, we've seen, very few changes recently, things have become, that is, the changes in our forecast. Uh, during the recession in the early period, it, it was incredibly volatile. From one period to the next, we would change the forecast from like we're going to be positive two to negative two, and uh, just every quarter was a roller coaster. And for the last year and a half, two years, it's been extremely stable. Uh, so expectations, it's kind of the same notion as what we were talking about, what I was talking about in terms of uh, interest rates. Uh, in fact, the expectations are being met, that there's sort of stability in the outlook is a very encouraging sign. Uh, we expect uh, to be adding somewhere of about 10 to 12,000 jobs uh, per year. That is about one and a half percent. That's not bad. Before the recession, we were often seeing numbers that were closer to 3%, but one and a half percent is more than enough to uh, deal with population changes. <coughs> It's enough to uh, lead to a long-term decline in unemployment. Uh, leading the charge is healthcare, for reasons uh, already stated. And secondly, transportation seems to be really uh, kicking in. And a lot of that is in the southern part of the state. There's an awful lot of stuff going in, going on around uh, Doniana County, uh, Santa Teresa, uh, discussions about a new possible rail line that would come directly out of uh, Mexico into New Mexico, um, avoiding the sort of congestion that you see in El Paso. If that were to occur, that would be a big deal. 
uh, ge geographically, uh, growth has been sustained by the oil producing regions. That's going to sort of wane. Albuquerque uh, sort of joining the party a little bit, and Cruz is, as almost always, uh, remaining the fast, fastest growing. Uh, the, if anything, I would say that the forecast is a little bit on the pessimistic side <coughs> because we continue to anticipate very weak housing markets. Um, any increase in the housing markets could have a very significant impact. Uh, these are some of the assumptions that we use. Um, most importantly here, uh, we do not expect any significant increase in federal, state, and local uh, government spending, continued uh, expansion of Medicaid. And I will note that these numbers are way too high. Um, this forecast was done in late, uh, mid, late January based on, well, once I knew it was at the end of the year. So uh, it never ceases to a surprise how oil prices are tumbling. Uh, so looking at this, uh, comparing New Mexico to the US, uh, this is, again, rates of growth of employment, uh, we see us basically catching up, uh, remaining somewhat below, uh, remaining below uh, the nation for the next couple of years, but this is because the US, the US is growing very quickly, New Mexico getting up to about one and a half, uh, one, four percent, um, but sort of sustaining in this level where the United States, uh, the national economy starts to, to sort of uh, temper some in the out years. Uh, income growth uh, tracks a similar pattern. I think the, more, the most important thing to note about this is whereas you can see that we often fall way below the nation in terms of employment growth in the post-recession period, uh, the pattern's much more tame in terms of employment, uh, in terms of income growth. Uh, New Mexico has not been as low or uh, as far below the, na the national patterns in terms of income. That's largely because of the number of sort of income support programs, uh, the degree of social security, Medicaid, et cetera, that New Mexico uh, receives. So it tends to put a floor under income patterns. Uh, looking at this by sector, healthcare, by far adding the great, this is the total number of jobs added over a four year period forecast, uh, healthcare by far the largest, uh, it's also the largest sector, so it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's the most rapidly growing, but it is where most of the jobs are being created. Um, construction, just to put some things in context, in the most optimistic, on the left you see this in the sector, let me look at this shower right here. In the most optimistic scenario, in, in 2005, uh, in New Mexico, we were producing, this is, these are permits for new housing construction, we were producing uh, almost 16,000 houses per year in 2001, 2005, uh, 2006, around then. In the most optimistic scenarios, um, we do not exceed 40% of housing production of, uh, um, of 2005. This might be actually a very good thing. Um, Maybe we'd like to see it up to here, but we do not want to see uh, what we saw in 2005. Um, and we have no expectation of that happening. The second thing I would point out on this chart is, and this is a national pattern, but very much, um, and kind of surprisingly, something that we're seeing in New Mexico as well. Uh, the blue are multifamily. <coughs> and what we're seeing is that a much higher percentage of housing units being produced are in multifamily, uh, as, much, as much as a third in New Mexico, uh, where we were seeing over uh, in 2005 as, as, as few as five or six percent of total housing units are in multifamily. Now we're looking at 30 percent. Uh, this is partly because so many kids graduate high school won't move out. Eventually, they're going to have to move out, and. Um, they're going to start looking for multifamily units, rentals, um, et cetera. And I think there's secondarily a sort of preference shift that is true nationally um, for living in sort of more urban areas, living downtown and the rich uh, environments where uh, 
one is happy to live in, in, a, in a smaller place but be more centrally located. Uh, just comparing our forecast to those of neighboring states, I must say that we are below uh, the other, but you know, university, I've been looking at this thing for about, we do this almost every, we do this every year and we've been doing it for about five years. And you know, it's not just that the other economy is growing faster, they're just way more optimistic than we are. Their numbers, they always seem to overshoot where we're much more um, uh, sober, I would say. But they often out there like, oh, we're gonna get 4% growth. And then they come back, well, okay, do that. Um, to be a different philosophy in terms of how to be forecasting. Uh, and this is looking for 2016, uh, slow improvement. Um, we are going to be doing a new forecast in beginning in a couple of weeks. My guess is that this number will be up two to three tenths of a percent. So we might be looking at something like 1.5 and 1.6. So better data tends to produce better uh, forecasts. Uh, where are the jobs? Uh, the purple is non-metro. Basically, we forecast four regions. Uh, the three large metro areas, Albuquerque, uh, Santa Fe, and Las Cruces, and then non-metro. <coughs> Look at this. Uh, during 2012, uh, the oil boom, rapid growth of employment, uh, particularly in those uh, two areas, the northeast, the northwest and southeast. Uh, but this is going to taper off um, as we move out. Conversely, Albuquerque, which was really slogging in 2010, uh, going becomes and begins to track <coughs> overall. So basically, the point is that um, Albuquerque tends to be much more an engine of growth because it's sort of centrally located and its businesses are much more tied to state business than are the oil producing activities, which tend to be geographically more peripheral, um, not as and not as tied to New Mexico businesses, particularly if you go down to the Permian Basin, many of those businesses are receiving their services from places like Odessa Midland. They go to the hospital in Lubbock, so it's not necessarily having the same local impact. Uh, I'm sure I just more than my half hour, but it always happens. <laughs> Thank you. From the beginning. So while Jeffrey was speaking, I was taking a few notes back there because there are a few things that uh, I'm coming from this from the perspective of a regional economic development organization that's on the ground trying to run programs to grow the economy. And so there's a few things that Jeffrey mentioned that I think are completely relevant and I w just want to bring them back, highlight some of the things he said a few minutes later. But just to get started on this, I just want to, <coughs> why are we here? Hold on. Okay. All right. So just to get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on what Ready is. The Ready is run by the Regional Development Corporation, or the RDC. The RDC, very quickly, is what the, was created by the Department of Energy back in the 90s called a community reuse organization. They stood these organizations up all over the country, wherever there was a uh, DOE facility. And it was basically intended to diversify the economy around those communities. And it, it was funded up by DOE, ran for a few years. Change of administration, funding goes away. 85% of the CROs around the country went away. They stayed it primarily in the communities where you have a uh, nuclear mission. And so we're here, there's another one in Hanford, there's one at Oak Ridge, that kind of place. But our mission is primarily economic development. <coughs> we have been contracted by Los Alamos County as the primary to act as the entity that administers the READY program, or the Regional Economic Development Initiative. Back in 07, Los Alamos decided to create what they call the Progress Through Partnership Initiative. Let me see, do I got a pointer in this thing? Oh, I do. Uh, which was 
intended on sharing some of the gross receipts that were captured when DOE, uh, when Lanel management went to a private sector with some of the other communities to grow the regional economy. Historically, northern New Mexico communities have not cooperated on economic development activities. Well, historically, they haven't cooperated much at all. But in economic development activities, they have not really worked well together. Back in 07, the RDC, which I was not part of at that time, started a process of creating a red, uh, initiative, getting everyone together with these long-term goals, two, three decades of growing the economy in, in specific targeted ways that everyone could agree on. And that's what the Ready Initiative really is. And next. It is, covers four counties, three <coughs> municipalities have signed on, the eight northern pueblos. So this is the Ready region. And you can see we have, where is this pointer? We have Rio Riba, Taos, Los Alamos County, and Santa Fe. City of Española, City of Santa Fe, Town of Taos have also joined on. The mission, diversify the economy, develop a high quality workforce, increase the number of high paying jobs, retain and attract youth and families, as we heard from uh, Jeffrey's presentation. Retaining your workforce is something that ever, we sh all should be striving for, and making rural communities vibrant. The communities were the ones who determined the needs and focuses. It took two years of work groups, focus studies, uh, interviews with community stakeholders to finally get, come up with a comprehensive plan that everyone could agree upon. And after that time period, they hired the RDC once again to go forth and conquer. So what it is, we have been tasked with four primary pillars of activity develop the region's infrastructure. Have you, any of you heard of ReadyNet? The broadband structure? That's what we worked on there. Human capital, develop our workforce in primarily. To this end, we created a program called Accelerate. And I have some slides on this later, but I'm probably gonna skip over this. I'm just hitting this now. Accelerate is basically a workforce training program at six of our colleges in the region focused on helping the non-traditional students, the person who has lost their job, never graduated from high school or one thing or another, go in and get a STEM basic training program. The, the bottleneck is every one of these six campuses in the region has good programs to train up workers to get these types of jobs. There is a need for the jobs here in Los Alamos and around the area, uh, region for that, but our students were not getting them. It was something like the graduation rate of student entering the program and coming out the end was around 6%. And the biggest, it, the, we went in, we looked at what are the bottlenecks, and the biggest ones were, well, of course, math. Math skills for a lot of our students coming into these programs are just subpar, and they are, they've been out of school for a long time, they probably never were very comfortable with math to begin with, and they just could not get through. And so this program, the Accelerate Initiative, has a math camp where they actually go in and do robotics and an intensive math camp for six weeks in the summer, and then they hit the classes in the fall. Uh, they have aggressive, interactive coaches with you that basically, if you don't make it to class, they're writing you, they're writing you behind to say, where were you today? Why weren't you in class? Oh, you had kids? You couldn't come into school? Well, let's work on getting childcare for you. They have job training basic skills like how to dress for work, how to interview, all those things are incorporated in this. And so the program's about three years, uh, we're in our fourth year now, just secured funding from DOE for the fifth year, which they gave us funding for up to five years, not past that. And it, we have several hundred graduates now, and the graduation rate for students entering this program is more than double from what it is prior. So we're making a dent in this. Uh, Public policy, we work with the regional governments, the state government and federal side on policies that basically promote the economic growth of this region. Economic development, this is the meat and potatoes of what we do. Economic development services, services to the community, services to businesses. Kurt Steinhaus back here is very familiar with this because we work very closely with his office on what's called, uh, well, what was called Los Alamos Connect which is direct business services to many businesses through a variety of avenues. And we have staff, I'm not the person who does that, but we have staff who basically are 
coaches working with businesses directly on a variety of different uh, venues. There's also the Venture Accelerator Fund, which is primarily funded through Kurt's side, but we've also been able to get other communities, Los Alamos, City of Santa Fe, Santa Fe County, all to contribute to the VAF, which has become a no interest loan for businesses that have reached the point that they have real potential for growing and growing economic based businesses. But they're also at the point where they can't get there unless they get some extra resources. So these are funds to help them get past that point and they have to pay back the loan if they reach certain real success benchmarks or they sell the company or move out. And we had one company that sold to Google last year and we had our first payback, so yay. <laughs> and the best thing is Google left them in, here in northern New Mexico, so they're still here. So uh, the, those are the areas that we work on. The clusters, the economic clusters that the region all could agree on were, of course, because back in 2008 when we were having this conversation, Los Alamos was, it was and is the economic driver of northern New Mexico, so technology. How could they, what is a cl technology cluster? That's why they have to drive a Mack truck through and two more Mack trucks buy it. Uh, but industries that could be grown around the technology cluster. Back around 2008, everyone was very interested in renewable energy, so that one was put in here also in the green industry and renewable energy. Media, that is digital media in the film industry. And value-added agriculture, that one was a contentious one. Some communities really did not feel that value-added agriculture was growing the economy with high-paying jobs, which is the goal. We're supposed to be creating high-paying jobs. But many of our other communities were very adamant that they wanted this to happen. And so it did. And believe it or not, that has the strongest constituency, and we're seeing really great growth in that sector. And I'm going to speed this up, so bear with me here. Now, actually, I'm going to change the order here a little bit. <laughs> Apologize. I want to go back to some of the stuff Jeffrey was talking about. New Mexico has lagged behind the rest of the nation, and northern New Mexico, in particular, has lagged behind the rest of the state. These are the job losses. And my numbers are not as re recent as his, but these are the job losses that you have between 08 and 12. You see the U.S. by 2012, the U.S. had basically recovered to the flat point. We were flat at that point. The state overall had grown a little bit. Of course, I think you're right that there's, there's some funny math going on there in some of the job loss or uh, unemployment. But this region, we were deep, deep in the hole. Here's a workforce up through mid-year last year. If you look at the number of workers we had in May 2008 compared to where we were at uh, May 2014, you see we are losing workforce. So I heard that number that you stated about a net 10,000 jobs or workers that we no longer have in the state. It's persons. persons. So these numbers are based off, basically it looks like we've had 8,000 people either leave the region, disappear, or just are no longer actively able and pursuing work in, in our area. Sorry to depress you. <laughs> Labor availability. Oh, actually I'm gonna come back to that in a bit. I just wanted to show you that. I had a lot of slides on that, but I knew he was coming, and one thing that Beaver's good at is stats. Um, but that being said, I completely agree that since 2014 we are starting to see an uptick in activity here. Here's just a symptom. If you are a business person, which I think almost everyone in here is, and you're looking at possibly trying, to, what, what are the prospects for the region, here's just some anecdotal signs of activity going around. The Commercial Center of 599, this is actually a privately financed development to actually, have you you've driven the 599 lately and seen that construction? That's privately funded to build a new uh, intersection there to get it off, on and off the 599 to move traffic to this new development center. So that's a big, big investment on the part of the cooks who are, are running that project. Rancho Viejo, 
Over on the other side, the, the southeastern side of Santa Fe, many people considered one of the fastest growing areas. They have this beautiful building that's been put out there. Anyone ever been out to, near the community college and seen this? BTI, or Bicycle Technology International, is a success story everyone in this state should know about, and we should be championing them and helping them grow. This company started as two guys in a bike shop in Oregon. Got, they moved to Santa Fe on their own, and they've now grown to be a company where they're the second largest wholesaler of high-end bike parts in the world. And they are running, basically out there, a Amazon warehouse for bikes and bike components. And, and it's, BAF helped get them started. And ve yes, they did get a Venture Accelerator Fund uh, grant at that point in time. It was free money. Santa Fe Brewing Company. Just this last year, they were able to secure $250,000 in state LIDA funds. Here's the governor and Secretary Barella uh, at the announcement ceremony. They're going to be doing an expansion, a 52,000 square foot expansion to greatly increase their productivity. They are now selling in eight states, and I think their plan is to be in 12 by the end of this year. Uh, the yellow cans, the happy camper cans, th this is them, and they're doing quite well. And as you can see there, it doesn't look like Secretary Barella likes beer. <laughs> Taos Mountain Energy Bars, two guys that ski in the winter, hike and climb in the summer, and they would make their own granola or their own type of snack food, high energy, high protein food to go out there. They shared too many of their Ziploc bags with people and people started asking for it and pretty soon they were actually making it in their own kitchen. Then they moved to a small commercial kitchen that's available in Taos. And now they have an order from Kroger's for 60,000 bars per month plus several other customers. Their sales are just skyrocketing. It got to the point they could not keep up. They were looking at moving production to Colorado where they had many facilities that are still asking them to come on up. We can do this for you. And we did. But it looks like they are planning on going and building a facility in Cuesta. And if any of you know Cuesta, good for them. <laughs> <laughs> this, did you know that Taos seems to have a cosmetics cluster growing there? There are more than a couple companies that are producing high-end cosmetics for markets stretching all the way to the European Union. This one I'm just bringing up because they just completed a major expansion where they bought out an old car dealership that was on the side of the road when you're driving to Taos. They've converted the entire back section where they did car maintenance into a manufacturing facility for these basically chapstick maker. They make um, cosmetics or high-end, 100% organic cosmetics for other brands and high-ends. They're in Target. You'll never know what the, you're having it, but you're, a lot of it's coming from Taos. Taos Ski Valley was purchased. I'm putting this up here because Lewis Bacon bought this about a year and a half ago. He has pledged to put $130 million in economic, uh, in development, and redevelopment of that facility. Right now, Jane's Construction is going to begin construction next month on three and a half million dollars in hotel improvements and they just put in a new ski lift. They're promising to replace all the other lifts. They're promising, uh, th there's a lot of activity going on there. You're gonna see a lot of money flowing out of there. Taos Mount Mesa Brewing. I'm going by county if you hadn't no noticed here. Uh, another little brewery that is growing in leaps and bounds, talking about opening a new bottling facility in Cuesta. Who knew? Malting. So if you hadn't noticed, beer is becoming a thing. The microbrewing industry is huge nationwide and it is growing quickly in New Mexico. If you go to the capital right now, there's about 15 pieces of legislation floating around around the brewing industry. Uh, one of the main components of brewing is you need your grain and you need your grain malted. And there are malting facilities that are owned by the major breweries that make the malt for them but there's only one malting facility in the entire western U.S. that produces high-end malt for the microbrewers, and they're up in, I think, Durango. The plan is, by a group of uh, people up basically in northern New Mexico, they want to build a malting facility here and create a, a new uh, endeavor. And put this up here because this, this has real potential, especially in the value-added agriculture cluster that I mentioned earlier. Ah, now Rio Riba and Española. I got to say kudos to Rio Riba and Española. If you had any experience with these communities 20 years ago or so, 
no one got along, no one talked to each other, no one did, it, it was just bring a, bring a knife or gun. Um, they are cooperating so well. It, things are going so well between those communities and with the other communities around them right now. Rio Riva hired their first professional economic development director for the first time last year, and they are completely serious about trying to grow their economy. Española, which is lagging behind because they're having just some in, internal issues with organization, has hitched their wagon to Rio Riva. They're working cooperatively. They're jointly funding many programs. Uh, here they are at a groundbreaking of a small business down in Española. Actually, it's not a small business. It used to be a small business. Now they have 80 employees. For New Mexico, that's not a small business. PMI, they moved their operations to Española. This is June. Um, this is June. This is last week. That building went up quickly. They're already talking about a 10,000 square foot expansion. Here's an area that they're cooperating. Agriculture again. The Rio Riba, Española, and many other organizations in the area have agreed to create what's called a food hub. It's a location for bringing your uh, for farmers and producers to bring your products for aggregation, storage, cooling, and wholesaling or retail sailing, selling. They're also reopening a, food, a commercial food kitchen in the area. They have a pending final passage of the capital outlay bill in the legislature right now. They will have secured jointly $900,000 in matching funds to that will go towards a $2 million USDA grant, and they have several other sources. This is happening. They're already working on it. It's the old Ford dealership in downtown Española, if you've seen it. It's, it's going to be exciting. There's, there is exciting things happening in Española, and I couldn't have said that two years ago. Okay. Now, other things that are going on, the Jobs Council. How many of you are familiar with the legislative, Interim Legislative Jobs Council? I heard you mentioning some numbers earlier about jobs being, uh, employment being created. Uh, so you're saying that we're growing about 10,000 jobs annually? Uh, the last year, we did 12. Okay. And that basically matches population growth or? Slightly, well, or last year. Well, better than population growth these days. <laughs> um, so the Interim Jobs Council was created by then Speaker Kenny Martinez and, the, and current Speaker Don Tripp to uh, tried to develop legislative policies for restarting the New Mexico economy and getting us back at least to 2008 levels. They hired a consultant named Mark Lottman who, um, uh, to facilitate these discussions and the numbers they came up with are basically saying that statewide we needed to create 160,000, you see that e-base, that means economic base job. Economic base is different than a t typical job. What it basically means is a job where 50% of the revenues that are coming in to pay for that job are coming from outside the state. If you open up a, uh, a barber shop, that's good business for yourself. But you're recycling the money in the economy, which is okay, but the minimal value of actually growing the economy. The way you grow an economy is you get people to, from outside your area to give you money, and that's your economic base. So they're saying over 10 years we needed to create 160,000 jobs, that's 16,000 economic base jobs a year. Any opinion on those? You've heard this before, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the proposals within this um, that this was regionalized. All the proposals that came up with, they did have total consensus by all participants, but they required that the regions do their own mini job councils to try to figure out what we needed locally. And so we took that on. At the last Ready State of the Region conference, we started a three meeting series. It, we started this last August. And what we came up with, we have about 12, 13 percent of the population. Basically, it turns out we need to create 10 percent of those six. 160,000 jobs, or 1,600 jobs a year on average for the next 10 years. <coughs> now, the RDC, my organization, does keep 
or metrics on how many jobs are being created in the region on an annual basis. Actually, what we do is we contract out to someone and come in and do an independent survey. We're not doing 1,600. <laughs> we're doing less than 500. Some years, much less than 500. But we, we're not doing 1,600. So if we were to accept these as the goal that we should be going forward with, then we need to rethink our game a little bit. And we're, we're having those discussions right now on how to go forward on that. Oh, I've already gone through this. Northern. OK. One thing we're doing is we're talking about basically two approaches. You have business recruitment, bringing businesses, the existing businesses, and convincing them to move here, and business re retention and expansion taking an existing business, helping them stay open, helping them stay here, and helping them grow. Both of them are valid strategies for growing businesses. And then you can also add entrepreneurship, helping startups get going as well. All of these help create businesses. All businesses create jobs. So we were tasked by the Ready communities with looking at both. Um, This is what basically the northern New Mexico labor availability looks like. This is done by a SWAT where we hired uh, site selectors who work for businesses to find locations. We hire them to come in and assess our communities for our possible recruitment or just how do we look to a business owner. Northern New Mexico labor availability, anything above seven is considered pretty strong in, in this spectrum. Uh, so you see clerical, we're good, unskilled, we're good, semi-skilled, we're a little bit below par, skilled, we're just right about there. Northern New Mexico labor characteristics. This is compared to the rest of the country. For turnover, our workers are, we have a good, very good turnover rates so of not, not turnover, of not losing our workers. Absenteeism's low, attitude is pretty good, trainability is decent. Basic skills, uh, we need to work there. Communication, this is where we were expecting to be pretty low, but it turns out the communication is not defined on ability to speak English, per se. Uh, it's more ability for the shop manager to talk with the shop employee. We are not a right-to-work state, but we, only 4% of our workforce is unionized, and a strongly unionized workforce by the site selectors has been identified as one of the biggest obstacles between uh, management and and staff. Uh, so th we scored high on communication there. This is the one that really surprised me. Alcohol and drugs for northern New Mexico, we're pretty good. And we actually brought that up and talked with the consultants about that. I said, yeah, but you look at those other communities, they all got the math. <laughs> so if you go to Clovis, where the dairy industry is strong, they can't get truck drivers to drive those trucks from the dairy farm to the milk factory or to the cheese factory because everyone has the same problems. We're, we're not that unique, different flavor, but a diff pretty much the same stuff. And we're actually okay there. And labor productivity is great. So our workforce is strong. Now I'm gonna share with you Los Alamos's. And we're gonna compare Los Alamos to a similar community, Boise. Well, they consider it a similar. So, Los Alamos in the red, Boise in the blue. Labor availability for technical, okay, we're both pretty close. Clerical, Boise is a little bit better there. Unskilled, we beat, well, we're a 10. Semi-skilled, they're better than us, and skilled. So if you're a business looking at needing a similar kind of workforce, similar kind of community, between Boise and Los Alamos, uh, it's about, equal. I don't have the actual scores here, but it actually scored very, very close. Los Alamos labor characteristics compared to Boise. Uh, productivity is higher. Our alcohol and drug situation is better. Communications is much better. Basic skills is better. Trainability, there's a, they scored a little bit higher than us. Attitude, we're a little bit higher than them. Absenteeism is better. And turnover, they're slightly better. So, if you're comparing Los Alamos to Boise, we're doing quite well. Actually, in Los Alamos' labor market, we have to remember, includes the valley. It includes parts of Santa Fe. It includes basically northern New Mexico. So overall, for technical areas or 
Los Alamos is decent. Um, I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place with this, but I just wanted to share that with you. So I'm going to skip this. I already went over some of the programs that we administer. I'm going to just shoot past these here. I just want to talk to you about recruiting, which I mentioned. Recruitment, bringing new businesses in. This is something we are actively working on. When you have a prospective business, you give it a project name. And we'll just call this one Project Dry. This could be a game changer for Rio Riva County. They are a company who manufactures uh, certain types of construction material that are used in both uh, residential and uh, construction materials. They have three manufacturing facilities scattered, one in China, one in Idaho, one in another location, and they are talking about centralizing them all in one site. And we are deep into final discussions about a purchase of a property in Española. If this goes forward, you will have trucks rolling in June. And in the end stage, 130 manufacturing jobs in Española. And it would be something. But again, if anyone has ever done recruitment, you got a one in 200 chance of actually landing it in the end. But this one's pretty good. We're excited about this one. Other type of recruitment. When we did that SWAT, we were looking at those clusters. The one I met, forgot to mention was outdoor recreation. That wasn't even on the original assessment. But when we did this SWAT a couple of years ago, it came back to us. They, uh, our site selectors came back to us and said, yeah, you're OK on this one. This one, you have some weaknesses, blah, 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 blah. But there's a couple targets of opportunity here that we saw here that we, you should really consider. And one of them was for possible uh, siting of defense uh, contractors on Native American lands. And so we took that to the, our, all our partners. Some of them were yeah, some of them were no, so we did not adopt that. It wasn't no consensus. This one had full consensus, trying to attract outdoor recreational industry. This would be manufacturing, service, uh, infrastructure type things around outdoor rec. These are small companies for the most part. For the high-end products, you've got your uh, bike, small bike manufacturers or your ski manufacturers or a variety of different things that run the gamut of things. And that we are working now on starting to try to attract them. Remember that company I mentioned earlier, BTI, that bike company? They are, they are kind of like the kernel that we're, or the grain of sand we're trying to grow the pearl around now because they are, they've reached the size now, a, a critical mass, where you're seeing one company now, one bicycle manufacturer has now relocated to Santa Fe just to be closer to their supplier so they don't have to get their shipments via UPS. Now they just send their own truck down the street, pick the stuff up, and come back home. So that kind of stuff. We have real potential there. And between what we're calling the, the triangle of the Santa Fe Taos Los Alamos triangle, oh, there's so much good stuff there. And this is a copy of a brochure, which I left in the car, but I'll go out and get them so you can all see what kind of material we're sharing when we're going out to the trade shows. Anything? Okay. I guess I'm done, and I'll let Patrick go. I'm sorry if I went too long. So I will be very brief. Um, if you need to leave, please do so. I understand we're already um, well past our time. Um, so I'll go, I only have about eight or ten slides. I'll go through them quickly. If anyone's interested in having a longer conversation, grab a card of mine off the table, give me a call, um, come in and sit down, and we can talk whenever, whenever you'd like. So I, I am not an economist, but I'm going to uh, pretend to be one. So I thought the best way to do this is to kind of talk about who we are as a, a community and what drives our economy, um, where, where's our economy now, um, and where might we be headed. So who we are, so uh, a disclaimer here, Greg Fisher, for the county's economic vitality administrator is not here, um, but he put out a report in January and I stole almost all of my data from his report. So I want to make sure Greg gets credit for that. Um, this is comparing uh, 2008 to 2012, Los Alamos County on the right versus uh, the nation as a whole on the left. So home ownership rate, and, and this is not going to be a surprise to many people who've been here for a long time, or higher in almost every, 
every category, home ownership rate, uh, median value um, of, of homes, um, household income is, is double basically the, the national average. Um, per capita money income is very high. What I highlighted here in red, um, retail sales per capita. So we're almost $8,000 lower um, in retail sales per capita, and that's based on where those sales take place. Um, so what does that imply? The, the dreaded leakage term that we've all heard forever um, in Los Alamos. Um, persons below the poverty level, again, um, we're, we're much lower than, than the nation as a whole. Let's look at our, our age ranges. Um, so the median age in 2000 was 40.8, 2010, 44.3, um, 2014, and, and estimated to be 46 in our community. Um, population over age of 65, 12%, 15%, and estimated now at 16%. Um, population under 25, 30%, 28%, and 27%. So again, as everyone who's been here for any period of time knows, um, we are an aging community, um, and, and that's uh, you know, troublesome in, in terms of being able to um, bring in young workforce, young families um, to grow the community. Unemployment rate in December was 3.1. Um, you can see by the chart here that goes back basically from January um, of 2000 um, through the last 15 years. Our unemployment has been very, very low traditionally in the county, um, even during uh, the recession when it, it grew up to a little over 4%. That's still substantially lower than what the, the nation has been. Oh, one last thing. So we have more than 18,000 jobs in the county. Our population is less than 18,000. Um, again, this is something that is unique here um, compared to most places. Um, and if you take out of our population numbers the amount uh, and you look at just available workforce, it's even more of a, of a gap. Um, so this is taxable gross receipts in our county by business sector. Um, this does not include uh, this is only up through 2014, so this doesn't include any change that may or may not have occurred with, with the new Smith's Marketplace that's opened up. Um, services um, is by far the highest, and you can uh, imagine that that is, is coming from lands, uh, the majority of that. Um, the orange line is construction, um, retail and food is gray, and telecommunications is there um, in yellow. And those have remained um, relatively flat over the last five years. Um, it does look like in 2013 they're starting to come up just a bit. Um, but our gross receipts tax is obviously dominated um, in, in one category. So Lanel employment in 2014 was, was just over 10,000 and I, I point this out um, just because they are the largest employer obviously in our community. Um, that has held pretty steady since the last uh, uh, voluntary separation that was done a few years ago. Something that's interesting, the fastest growing industries in Los Alamos County, and I apologize for the typo there, in 2014 was general merchandising, had a 15% growth overall. So what we're looking at here is percent growth per industry and, and what the highest is, wholesale, professional equipment and supplies, um, and then portfolio management. Um, but you can see that we still suffer um, from significant retail leakage. So if you look at, just for example, for full service restaurant sales in Los Alamos, 4.6 million. Typical sales for a county of 18,000 are 15.8 million. Um, so we're at about 25%, um, and that's, that's pretty consistent down the line. So where are we headed? Um, this, is, this is kind of my take on things. Um, it, it may be wrong. Um, the Lanel budget, that's always something that people talk about. Well, what's the lab's budget gonna be? What's it gonna be next year compared to where it's been in the past? Um, the early indications and signs that I've seen is that next year's budget is going to be very similar to this year's. So that's been a consistent pattern. And if, if Johnny or Kurt want to correct me, please do so. Um, you know, that's been a consistent pattern over the last few years um, where the budget has been re relatively flat but not falling. Um, the Smith's Marketplace, um, what is that, how is that going to impact the economy? Um, it's a little early to say it's been there, what, six or eight months now. There's some preliminary data, I'm assuming with gross receipts tax, from everything I've understood, the store is tracking um, right at their, their projections um, coming in to, to opening last July. Um, ad additional new development. There is a, a, an opportunity for new development in town. Um, there's 
the A19 development down in White Rock that will hopefully be adding rooftops to the community. Um, there's the 1010 Central, which is the vacant lot next to the municipal building um, that has an opportunity for new development. Um, I, you know, there's, uh, there's a hotel property that uh, has the opportunity to be redeveloped where the old Hilltop House was. Um, so I, I do believe there are uh, opportunities here in the short term for new and different types of development in the community. Um, and then redevelopment of existing commercial properties as well. Um, here's one of the, uh, let's see, the big ones here, the Manhattan Project National Historic Park um, that everyone is very excited about. Um, that is a great opportunity if the estimated figures are correct in terms of the number of tourists coming in. And when you're talking about um, economic development, tourism money um, is an absolute export economy. You're bringing all the money in from outside. So there is no circulating of dollars from that. Um, so, you know, th there's a, a great potential there um, on the retail hospitality side um, to be prepared for, th for the influx of tourists that may occur with that. Um, snow making at Parito. Um, you know, this is something we've never had and we've long wanted. Um, and all signs are pointing that next snow season that capability will be there. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting what kind of impact that will have on, again, the tourism economy in town um, over the winter seasons. And as I mentioned before, new housing options. Um, the, uh, one of the best way to grow the, the economy or the business sector in the community is to add rooftops and to add people to that economy. Um, the county has a stated goal of growing to um, 20,000 people by, uh, by 2020. Um, so that's adding you know, anywhere between 2,000 and 2,500 people within the next uh, four and a half to five years. Um, and with developments at, at A19 um, down in White Rock, there, there is opportunity there to, to add some rooftops um, here soon. So what does this all mean? Like I said, there's a great opportunity. Uh, I, I believe, especially in the retail and the hospitality industries, um, hotels, conference centers, restaurants, um, in anticipation of the Manhattan Project National Park coming in. Um, we do have a small, but I believe growing technology sector in the community. Um, there are more than a handful of technology companies located in town that a lot of people don't know about um, because they don't have a storefront that you might see. Um, they're not selling goods to people who live here predominantly. They're selling their, their goods and services out of the community and out of state. Um, so just because you don't see these people and don't know these companies are around, they do exist. Um, and in terms of economic diversification within the community, that's, that's a very important um, thing to point out. Um, the Manhattan Project National Park, um, planning has already underway for that. It's, it's been underway for a while. Heather McClanahan here is, is spearheading a lot of that planning. Um, but in regards to that, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, if the numbers are, and estimates are correct, then we are going to see an influx of, of potentially 200,000 tourists a year into our community. Um, we need to be prepared for that. We need to uh, have the services that, that tourists require. We need to have a town that has the ability to host them overnight. Um, and that includes retails, restaurants, hotel options. Um, and many questions still exist. What, what is that part going to look like? You know, we don't know for sure. Um, how many people will, will be here? We don't know that either. Um, so that's, that's kind of an unknown. And that's the end of what I have to say. So I, I'm sorry if that was quick. Um, I don't want to hold people up anymore. And again, if, if you have questions, please give me a call. And I'm happy to sit down and, and chat with anyone. Thank you.